Dr. Scare? Yes, hello. There you are. Wonderful. Welcome. Oh, <laughs> it was a little complicated getting through the, uh, the numbering. I'm sorry to be late. Hopefully we can get some work done. All right. Let's do that. Okay. So I just did an introduction um, while we were waiting for you, but I do want to go ahead and just um, do a better job with that, I think, right? So I want to bring us up to um, – up to the current status of where you are now because you've been working in the field of trauma for over 30 years as a neurologist, a rehab specialist, but the work that you're doing now is really breaking through a lot of the different fields of working with pain, working with mental health, working with people and helping to explain neuroplasticity. So let me just ask you, with the new book, what is it that you're really trying to do, the eight keys? What do you most want to achieve with that? Well, what I do, what I, I wrote the book at the request of um, the, my editors at Norton. Uh, they had this, they had developed this eight key series, and Babette Rothschild, who I, you probably know, uh, is the uh, Norton editor for this series, and she's already written book a, a book about eight keys to safe trauma healing. Uh, Babette asked me to write a book about the brain in relationship to trauma and healing. Um, but a book for lay people, uh, a very definitely lay-oriented book uh, with enough sophisticated stuff to make uh, good knowledge available, <clears throat> but also with um, uh, simplifying it so a lay person can understand it without the base of neurophysiology that one might have with a degree in psych. So that's that was the purpose of the book. And then I basically wrote the book fashioned on uh, the, the work I've been doing over the years, uh, more recently I've got into uh, some other fields, some other concepts and, and ideas about trauma, uh, including brain plasticity, including uh, the mechanism for healing based on the neurophysiology of trauma, um, and issues related to uh, complex systems that promote affiliation with people because affiliation the ability to affiliate is one of the things that's lost in trauma. So, can you, can you speak lost... to, go ahead. Can you speak to affiliation for those that people that don't uh, understand? Affiliation is the ability to attune to another person's consciousness, thoughts, and ideas. It's blending your awareness of the present moment with another person in a way that bonds you together in a mutually understanding relationship. Uh, Alan Shore has written a lot about this. It goes way back to the work of uh, Bowlby with attachment disorder. Alan Shore has uh, written about the neurophysiology of attunement, the, the basis in, in brain function and development, uh, and the, the things that prevent attunement are also how that affects the brain. Um, and that's, a, that's been a critical thing. In, in all of my writings and lectures, I've talked about Shore's work with regards to attunement. But um, Stephen Porges has come up with some additional concepts within his vagal theory, a theory of how the, the vagus nerve, the two vagus nerves function in the brainstem and then their relationship with consciousness. You know what, I'd, and, like, to back to, I'd like to come back to Dr. Porges' work, but I'd like to lay a little bit more foundation before we go there, if that's all right with you. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> but it's his work, and, and combined with Shore's work, um, has raised a great interest in my, on my part in, in, the, in consciousness, uh, being in the present moment, and healing. Perfect, and that, that's actually right where I want to go. So many of the people that I think are associate, associate your work with the work of trauma, and yet in my reading of your work, what really drew me the most was how the work that you're doing really... Um, can be most utilized by the average person. In other words, when you start to speak about um, the freeze response and neurosomatic disorders, it's how does it, how does the work that you've been doing with the way that the neurophysiology works affect people's ability to be present? In other words, and not just the person with PTSD, and not just the person with, you know, disorders that are in the DSM-3 book. In other words, how does it affect my ability and my personal experiences or yours to be present with each other or with a client or with a child or present in their meditation? And I think that's where I'd like to start. So it's it's reaching the you and me's, not just the people that have been through big traumatic events. Sure. Well, you know, trauma is a bell curve. I mean, trauma, my definition 
definition of trauma is um, facing a life-threatening event in a state of helplessness. And that's pretty, that's well accepted, that that is the definition of trauma. That's how trauma occurs. But there's, like everything else, there's a spectrum of, of severity and intensity of negative life experiences that will determine the degree of the response to that, which is to freeze, of course, and the depth and persistence of the freeze response. For instance, a rape victim uh, who is assaulted, physically beaten, and raped, a terrible, terrible trauma, uh, will diso freeze, which is also to dissociate. Dissociation is what we perceive when we're in the freeze response. And it is also associated with the chemical and the physiological changes in the brain. So we may actually freeze where we become immobile, like the opossum, who's a prototype for the freeze response because he's weak and slow. But the degree of dysfunction, the degree and depth of the freeze will vary based on the intensity of the, of the assault uh, or the trauma. Uh, and coming out of it may be more or less difficult based on that severity. Then you've got layered on that the fact that the severity of one's tendency to freeze and the depth of the freeze as an adult is also directly co correlated with the <clears throat> burden of trauma that they've experienced throughout their lifespan, especially in childhood. And trauma in childhood will very much leave one more vulnerable as an adult to freeze in the face of even minor threats. So you've got these two continuums going here which determine the outcome when a person <clears throat> faces a traumatic event as an adult. So when they, for example, in the ACEs studies that are very well published as far as adverse childhood experiences, um, those experiences could be not just an experience of having suffered violence. It may be an ongoing source of stress in a dysfunctional family. It may be any number of sources from um, a, somebody with mental illness in the family. It might be something that they experienced on a singular basis or a repetitive basis, correct? Yes, that's, that's absolutely right, and <clears throat> like everything else, it's a continuum, but even what relatively negative childhood experiences, such as a, a mother who is uh, depressed or, or mental illness in other family members or alcoholism and the like that would affect the parent's behavior to be a good parent, will still leave a mark on the child. And even though it's something one takes for granted when one's older, you don't even think about it, but it, it's pertinent. I think that, you know, for a long time in our culture, you just lived with those things, didn't you? Exactly. I mean, everybody had, everybody had some problems in their childhood who didn't. But I think Every, now we're starting yeah. to understand the implications of those. That's exactly right. And the, I think the A study is a wonderful study. I wish it were more uh, accessible to the medical profession uh, who don't really know much about it. But uh, <clears throat> I think that the, the, we need to pay attention to even the minor stresses and traumas in one's life in order to understand the, the outcome and the effect on you, behavior and, and health. Well, let's talk a little bit about how things are remembered um, because you write a lot about different types of memory. And, you know, the difference between what is memory the way people normally think about it in their head versus what's sometimes called body or cellular memory. And, and there's so many variations, but I'd like to speak a little bit about how we remember or don't remember or remember in a different way things that have happened to us that continue to affect our present and our future. Yeah, there are many classifications of memory, and I'm not going to go into detail with those as I did in the right. book. <clears throat> uh, a lot of them have to do with conscious memory memory that um, is of facts and events, learning things, uh, remembering pertinent events in one's life, uh, remembering experiences and this sort of thing. And these, are, these are all called declarative memory. Uh, w when they're semantic, they involve words and, um, and ideas and things that one expresses in, in verbal interaction. Uh, but they may also be just uh, pleasant memories of features of the environment we grew up in, of our parents' appearance, of, of a host of things that, tend, that we tend to hang on to. But declarative memory also can simply be uh, episodic memory where we're filing uh, our memory and things that are going on in a continuous 
time pattern and discarding ones that aren't pertinent because we had there's we'd be flooded if we remembered everything about everything that's declarative memory and then there's unconscious uh, implicit or more i think accurately procedural memory procedural memory is the acquisition of skills where we strive to learn a sport and we practice the same movements over and over again and that they are stored in our unconscious memory, which means that they are movement patterns that we have fixed in our memory, but that we don't have to, we eventually don't need to think of the movement pattern in order to achieve the skill. The second thing that procedural memory involves is classical conditioning. In other words, learning about things in our life that are good and that are bad, that are <clears throat> safe and that are dangerous. Uh, it's basically how we survive is through procedural memory. That memory is held in the brain, not in the, not in the cells of the body, not in the muscles. It's held in the parts of the brain that represent that muscle, that, ex, that extremity, and that movement pattern. And this memory is it tends to be for life. It tends to be permanent. We never lose our skills in walking. We never, unless we have a disease. We don't lose our skills in skiing or playing the piano or the like. They may decay with time, but they're they're relatively hardwired. And we never forget events that we have uh, lived through that threatened our life. We never forget those. And right. the body memories for those diminish, but in the case of trauma, they don't diminish. They stay very prominent. So how so how does the body, in a sense, hold the memory of something that's been traumatized? Can you, I mean, is there a memory in the cells? It's, it's obviously neurologically it's different, and yet there is a remembering. There's a, the remember. Remember, all memory is in the brain. There's, right. There, there's. I don't agree with the concept of cellular memory. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's controversial, but it doesn't fit the the uh, brain model in that the the brain doesn't need the cells of the body to remember everything every cell. What happened to every cell? So the brain remembers everything that happened to the extremity, the pattern of movement, uh, the pain, uh, all of the symptoms or all of the uh, things that were done with the muscle group are held in memory, exactly as they were. Uh, you don't need to have cellular memory to, for the brain to remember every nuance of a motor experience. And in trauma, of course, it remembers all of the movement patterns that the animal or the, <clears throat> the person did to try to fend off the, the, the threat. And if the, that is not discharged, in other words, if that isn't completed at the end of the traumatic experience, then the brain will remember those things as if the danger is really there. So That's just to, to, bring that, to, bring, yeah, to bring that to a, a very ready experience, so if something attacks you, um, be it, let's just say a dog yeah. came after and attacked you. And, you know, most people understand we go in the fight or flight aspect of the response. Either I flee from that dog and I'm able to get safe and get behind a fence, or I'm not get, I don't have, that's not a good option, and I attack it back. And I start to go into some sort of physical expenditure to protect myself. Yes. If we, if we escape or, or we overcome the threat, uh, we are no longer traumatized. However, if the threat was severe enough, severe enough uh, and we actually went into a little freeze with, uh, at the time, then our, our brain brings up the memory of the movement patterns and we kind of go through a repetition of those movement patterns in the form of a motor action. In other words, shaking, trembling, hitting. Uh, our body replicates the movement pattern. In the in the freeze discharge, and you'll see that in an animal, uh, right. if they, they uh, are unconscious or they're frozen, when they come out, they generally shake all over in a pattern which is replicative of the attempt of their muscles and the brain to protect themselves. Why do you think most people, when we've spoken of the response to trauma, have only heard of fight or flight but not freeze? Why was that so underappreciated for so long? Do you think? Well, it's been underappreciated by by <clears throat> people who, who studied this, actually. Although, even, you know, people like Selye and uh, Pavlov and uh, Cannon, all neuroscientists who studied uh, behavioral patterns and conditioning, uh, recognized that the that 
animals would do this, that they would discharge, if you want. That's Some people use that term. Peter Levine uses that term. Right. Uh, discharge, the, not the energy, but the memory. And in that replication of the memory in a safe setting now, uh, the memory of all the motor actions is extinguished. It's like a conditioned response. And so that frees the brain of, of the burden of holding on to the false memories of uh, what you did to survive, even though you did survive and it's over. Extinction okay. of false memories is really what the, that what the freeze discharge is about. So I had a, um, I had, was asking for people that might have questions, and one person had um, a person in their family with seizures. Yes. And the response they they had noticed that the seizures often provided a regular type of physical response, like a pushing away, a similar movement that was done time after time after time. Yes. Could you speak to maybe the relationship between seizures and this type of freeze response as well. Well, the freeze discharge looks like a seizure. I don't okay. know if you've ever seen the polar bear video from yes, the National Yes, I, I yeah. certainly have. Yeah, these, a seizure, uh, a, um, a discharge often looks like a seizure. Now, because it replicates the failed movement pattern, it looks like an unusual seizure, but you can have a part of, if a part of the brain in the motor area, the muscle control area of the brain, uh, is damaged and therefore causes electrical discharges, the person will repeat a, m a movement maybe in, even in one extremity or in one side of the body. Um, but it generally replicates the movement pattern that was aborted by going into the freeze response. And when, the, when you do that, you're, di you're extinguishing the memory because it's, uh, uh, it's completing the act of escape, if you wish. That's a good way to put it. Okay. I've heard also that people say when they've come out of anesthesia, there are certain physical movements that replicate movements that may have gone into that they were doing before anesthesia. So, the, yeah, yeah. Correct, right. yeah. That happens. And I, I think that happens. It implies that that before the surgery, the person was traumatized by the experience when they go through the shaking. It's like when a, mo a mother, a lot of... Uh, Midwives will tell you that women go through shaking after a childbirth, uh, and the childbirth pain may be traumatizing in some women, and then, and as a result, at the end after the birth, they go through a discharge, a freeze discharge. So I think the same applies to post-operative cases after they awake. What about for those people that have been, we'll call it, in the body work field, so the massage therapy, the people that work with somatic hands hands-on clinicians. Yes. Um, that work on subtle ways and will, will often find when people are beginning to truly relax and maybe be present to some suffering that they've caused in their life, there tends to be a rippling or contraction of the abdomen and different types of muscular contractions as they begin to experience um, things that they've gone through in the past, whether it be feelings or physical traumas. Yeah, that, that's well known in body work. That including right. manual massage therapy, right, uh, Reiki, even yeah. any anything whether you manipulate the muscles, even physical therapy where you're doing repetitive movements to improve range of motion. Um, if you approximate the movement pattern that replicated the uh, failed attempt to protect yourself, the brain assumes that you're in a threat now, and it will go through the movement pattern. But in doing so. <clears throat> an attempt to complete the act of self-defense. But body work is associated frequently with that. And in fact, there may actually be a, a release of a, a deep emotional discharge, sobbing or crying or crying out as part of that. No, that's important. So when we look at some of the things, you know, and I know that you've worked with uh, Peter and in the semantic world, which is bridging a gap that most neurologists and brain scientists don't often do, or have yeah, the opportunity to do. And so that puts you in a unique position, I think, among people that can both speak from an academic level to the neurophysiology of what's happening in the brain, as well as to personally having experienced some of this kind of release. And it's quite unique, and I imagine that somewhat controversial, but I'd like you to speak a little bit, if you might, to your personal experiencing of transitioning from just the academic understanding to the physical experiencing. Well, you know, I, the, I write about it in the, in the introduction to my book, The Trauma Spectrum. I, the introduction is a, 
a story of my trauma and how I came into the field with this burden of trauma and and healed a lot of it. Um, I had I, an eye accident at age four where I lost my eye, um, and I had a very I had ether. I was hospitalized, blindfolded for quite a while, and uh, I never looked at it as a terrifying experience or a traumatic a trauma because I didn't know what trauma was, but it was. Uh, and when I got into this field and met Peter and had him do some work give a, a workshop to my pain program, um, and I sent him a few patients who got better with his work, I said, show me what you do. Well, he did. He did a session of SE with me, and my body went into the pattern of self-protection that it had gone into 60 years before, uh, a curling up of the left side of my body, a squeezing of my eye, and tilting to the left and shaking and trembling and sweating. And I, I realized medical science has never heard of this thing, whatever it is. Right. Um, and then I realized it's, it's doing what, I, what happened 60 years ago when I lost my eye. And then I thought, nobody in medical science knows anything about this. <laughs> but then I realized it also was like a condition called conversion hysteria. Uh, and you know what that is. I'm, I'm not sure everybody does is listening, but conversion hysteria is a repetitive movement pattern or pattern of muscular control or absence of control that occurs in someone who's been traumatized. Uh, usually they've had this childhood trauma, and often it's related to the childhood abuse, but um, it replicates the act uh, of their body during the assault. And it is thought to be psychological by the medical profession. It's called conversion hysteria because it occurs mostly in women. It has occurred mostly in women since it's been studied. Um, hystera being a derivative of the word for the uterus. So I realized that this was analogous to conversion hysteria, which I think is simply the, the pattern of a failed discharge of a uh, trauma and then repetitive emergence of that under stress but never completion, never emerging in a safe place so that it can complete the act of self-defense. So I realized all these things, and I realized that, uh, as far as I knew, I didn't know any other doctor who had ever thought this, much less experienced it, much less read about it in this fashion. So that started my career in trauma, basically. I think that the personal experience is um, you can't replicate that because you know what you know once you've experienced it, even if you're still understanding and figuring out the theories and the mechanisms behind it. So it's an invaluable experience to have gone through. Yes, exactly. It is. And and as a connector of fields and disciplines, which is um, so important. So well, I'm curious I, a little bit, if you could speak to a little bit of what you've, having, having been in the rehab neurology field, having then explored an outside that box world, and then starting to speak to it, how has the field of, on both sides of the aisle, um, taken to the work that you've been working on? Well, the psychology field has taken to it um, generally very accepting and actually uh, with a lot of excitement because what I explain in my model of, of the body and trauma is something that every psychologist or therapist sees every day in their practice. And it includes a lot of physical diseases that are common to trauma victims. And it, it tells why these diseases occur in the trauma victim based on the way the brain processes the information. So I've had widespread acceptance in the psychotherapy field. In the psychiatry field, I would say I've had much less acceptance. Uh, they've had an MD uh, training, which looks as, I have to say, looks at the body as a machine more the, than a complex entity. Uh, other than physically, and um, so I've, that's been gratifying. As far as the medical field go, goes, I've really had no opportunity to present my ideas to physicians in general. I know if it's, there's some physicians who've read my books who think the reasoning is is logical, and uh, uh, I think probably accept the theory, but it's not widely accepted or even known in uh, the medical field. I think that the work that you're doing is reaching the public in a lot of different avenues. 
And I think that the public's acceptance of an integrated body-mind kind of paradigm is is almost fully accepted. In other words, there's no longer that complete separation of that what I think and who I am are two different things, that what right. my that my thoughts don't affect my body and you know stress fortunately has been has served as that um that connector so to speak like a corpus callosum that's connect both sides yeah and you know when we look to cases of um those canaries so stress and PTSD now you know especially with returning veterans that these are the cases that can't be explained by previous mechanisms and are forcing us to open our minds both as far as clinical application, how we work with them, and how we understand them. So as much suffering as it's being caused, it's also, I think, opening a lot of doors to collaborative and new understandings as well. I really hope so. I mean, I, I, I caught this this new uh, epiphany-based uh, career in late in life, and uh, I hope that it does gain universal acknowledgement and also I hope they study it. I hope somebody can expand on it. I don't think I've got all of the story right, but I think I'm pretty close. So I'm, I I have hopes that this will uh, change the way some uh, doctors think about uh, some class of their patients. Well, you know, the studies that I hope continue in exploring different techniques, whether it be somatic re-experiencing, EMDR, EFT, a variety of these innovative techniques that are emerging right now, hopefully, and it looks like early studies are showing to be incredibly effective yes. from what we're saying out there. And I think that can only be held down or or denied for so long before it becomes an overwhelming amount of evidence. I absolutely agree with you. I think there's a tsunami of, of somatic psychological techniques that are emerging based on the work of many people. Uh, based mostly on uh, an experience with uh, using a, a certain type of therapy uh, and then expanding on it. And I think, it, yes, I think this is inevitable. It's going to take over the, a big part of the field uh, at some point. It's challenging, however. So speaking as a chiropractor, right, so body of work based on a very, um, you know, particular physical paradigm and based on an application of, the way that I do my work, does it then start to feel, would you say, are you seeing that it's overwhelming because, for example, somatic re-experiencing and, and certain other techniques can take a lot of time, can take a lot of attention, and, and it can somewhat threaten certain fields of maintaining a perspective of the way they've seen trauma and the way they look at pain, and it, and it may challenge a lot of paradigms. I think it does challenge a lot of paradigms. Um, the the Freudian paradigms with Freudian psychology and some of his later students' work um, is very metaphorical. In fact, the whole field of psychology is a metaphor, in a sense, for for the workings, the dysfunction of the mind, uh, dysfunction of consciousness. Because I, I actually, I think we talked briefly about um, presence. Uh, I think uh, trauma is the antithesis of presence. I think in trauma, one is not present 90% of the time. They are dissociated uh, in severe complex trauma. But, so, you know, it's a physiological model for a state that is talked about in metaphorical terms by the the generally psych-trained profession. And they have to make this leap to the uh, fact that every, everything that they're seeing, the entire DSM-4, uh, are descriptions of of uh, brain-based uh, neurophysiological states. When you spoke, just for those that don't, could you speak a little bit to the dissociation part? So for for the layperson, all of a sudden when you check out, okay, yeah. or the person, yeah, you when, when you just can't be present to the amount of sensory information that's coming in, what happens there? Well, what happens is that that um, you have experienced a cue some, some, somewhere in your environment that relates to and reminds your brain of, a, of an unresolved traumatic event. It can be a noise, an image, a face, uh, any of the senses that pick up a cue that was associated with a trauma may cause you to freeze or dissociate. Now, this can be very minor. It can be very minor. It can be... Uh, you know, you, you when you were a child, you had an uncle who molested you, who had a big mustache. You see someone with a big mustache, 
and you 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 startle, you go into a chill, and suddenly your mind is foggy, and you lose track of what you're doing. Uh, you may feel a little terror, but quickly you feel just numb and, and kind of lost, and your mind goes blank. Uh, then it comes out of it, and you may or may not recognize the fact that that was what triggered it, but uh, when a person with multiple early traumas, their, the environment is f- full of cues that trigger that. And so people who have had a lot of trauma will spend a lot of time in a fog, literally a fog, because the association of the freeze is associated with the release of endorphins, which are powerful painkillers, which are related to narcotics, which make one feel fuzzy and numb uh, and, and unable to really think clearly. That's dissociation. Dissociation can be profound, uh, can lead to uh, this this seizure that occurs because uh, you've seen something that was really traumatic or you've uh, come across a cue to a, a personal tra- childhood trauma such as incest or physical abuse. And you may just go blank and actually you may fall down and, and have a seizure uh, like uh, the polar bear did at, at, in the film that we're talking about. So, but it's a state of numbing, it's a state of, of confusion, you lose the present moment. And frankly, I think what we call monkey brain or intrusive thoughts right. are a minor state of dissociation because usually they involve a conflict that keeps going over and over in your mind. You ruminate on it, you, you chew it like a cud, like a cow. You, you can't turn it off, it wakes you and keeps you awake at night. What it is is... A, it's been cued by something that you dreamed or something that you saw or felt, and that brings up the conflict, and then you can't get it out of your head. And well, I think that that's, even, that's really important because for for many people, for example, that may go into some sort of body mind practice, whether it be a meditation practice or something similar, some sort of mindfulness approach, and they find that when they start, actually, number one, they often don't even notice the degree of monkey mindness that's happening. Yep, that's uh, right. on a conscious level, and then all of a sudden they start to shed a light on. And whatever technique that they're doing, whether via heart math, mindfulness, if anything, and they start noticing and witnessing. And yes. all of a sudden they start shedding a light on that degree of their inability to stay present or with a single thought or a single breath or a somatic something that yes. they're working with. And I think that that starts to be very uncomfortable for many people because otherwise it starts to be overwhelming. If I can't really be present, then I'm not going to even do it because it's too stressful to even just begin to go there. So could you speak to that a little bit? Well, when one's in that conflict, and the conflict can be loss of a job, it can be uh, a fight with a, with a spouse or partner, uh, it can be uh, a shock of their child having been in an accident, uh, or, or, or simply a situation that they can't resolve but they need to resolve. Well, today, for example, is Election Day, and it may be yes. traumatic for some people. Yes, I think it is. Right? It and and it's not a big D trauma, but for some, it can have. It can feel That's, that way. That's right. But intrusive thoughts gen- involve a conflict that's where you're helpless. You can't resolve it. You don't have the means to do so. And that, of course, is, is my definition of trauma. It becomes a little trauma. Until you resolve it, and when you resolve it, then, you know, it goes away. We say, well, that's because it's no longer there. Well, but while it's there, it tends to make you freeze a little bit and dissociate. And interesting, I've, I've, I've known people who can handle this intrusive uh, thought problem with, with tapping, with EFT. And tapping for a while will obliterate the thought for a period of time. Or Do you find deep, that cognitive? Uh, Do you think that cognitively... Deep, deep, by thinking you can change it, or it has to come from another means? I think it has to come from another means. I think one can cognitively use breath work to, to uh, control it. If one is, uh, is has a meditative practice, then I think they can use breath work to turn off the, uh, the, the uh, interest of thought. Okay. Can you speak to how the intrusive thoughts then affect the body, perhaps the role of cortisol or stress hormones, and how that affects health and well-being? So here are these intrusive thoughts that still I think people, even though they understand there's a body-mind connection, still think that it's happening just in the brain. 
Right. <clears throat> well, since I think it's the freeze response, what it's doing is affecting the autonomic nervous system because the freeze response is a deep state of dominance of the what's called the dorsal vagal nucleus in the reptilian brain. All creatures freeze, even reptiles freeze. Uh, you don't need a frontal cortex to freeze, but the, the vagus nerve, which uh, puts you in the freeze, uh, results in a an abnormal cycling between sympathetic and parasympathetic states. The freeze is a deep, deep parasympathetic state. Now we think of the parasympathetic state where we're we're resting and recovering and storing net nutrients. Well, uh, it, it also uh, slows our heart profoundly. It increases functions and activity of the gut because uh, basically the dorsal vagal nucleus determines digestion and defecation. Uh, but in an extreme state, it causes chaos in the gut. The soldier in the trench who's being bombarded may, may lose his bowels and his bladder because he's frozen. And that's a deeply parasympathetic state with overacted action of the viscera, of the gut. Um, so it's a very unstable state, and it's this instability in the freeze response that probably is the cause of all the diseases of the freeze that I write about. Uh, it's a, not a healthy place to be, and in fact, uh, sudden death may occur in mammals uh, who don't tolerate the freezes as well as reptiles because it slows the heart so much, the heart stops. So if we take that to a very diluted level, when people are all of a sudden scared and yes. they hold their breath and it just feels like literally everything just stops for that moment. I mean, yes. we see that all the time on a daily level. Does that speak to it almost on a homeopathic, very diluted level, would you say? Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that where everything stops, uh, they are frozen. Now, it, it, it can be transient. It may not be very deep. Right. Uh, but they, it, what, if they do this a lot, what will happen, they'll begin to get syndromes of the gut, like irritable bowel disease, like Crohn's disease, like gastroesophageal reflux, where you, acid from the stomach refluxes into the esophagus. Uh, in other words, the, the diseases of hyperactivity of the viscera, the lungs, the heart, and the gut, uh, are related to persisting freeze response. Okay. It can feel, I would say, the possibility is that it can start to get overwhelming. In other words, if there is this much that we're dealing with from our past, we're starting to uncover not only the big T traumas but the little T traumas, it seems as if we can be in a constant state of processing. We, uh, yeah, we are. And the trauma <laughs> victim is the trauma victim is seldom present, doesn't get anything done. Now that means, you know, doing things creatively that need to be done or you wish to do. Um, they're they're stuck in this state, uh, and they are generally socially isolated, uh, interpersonally isolated, uh, because uh, the world out there is terrifying. And you, you say, well, why aren't they just having anxiety attacks? Well, when you've been traumatized, you will have a, something that will cause arousal with that tight feeling in your you know pit of your stomach and that kind of thing. But because you've had so much trauma, you immediately go into a freeze. And that that feeling of arousal and terror goes away, and now you're in a state of confusion, a collapse. I've seen people, I've known people who have walked across the room and suddenly collapsed on the floor because they had a thought uh, that was re replicative of an old trauma. So it it, uh, it can take over your life, and of course you're seldom in the present moment then. It may show up, as you say that, um, I would imagine a lot in a relationship. So in yes. relationship things that trigger past wounds from past relationships, from childhood incidences, that that ability for two people to not meet and communicate in a clear way is often because they're in freeze response from cues and triggers that are coming from their past, I would imagine. Oh, yes. I would say that more marriages are broken up or relationships are broken up by this, this process than any other reason. And it... it and when the person breaks up, they don't know why. They only know that they become uncomfortable around this person, and they, but they, it's hard for them to define. And it's because it's all unconscious. The unconscious brain is ruling the relationship. And really, the unconscious brain is 
really the driver of most of what we're doing in our waking or unwaking life, in our daily life. That's a very good point you make because, <clears throat> and people write about this, uh, there's a Paul McLean's a, a physiologist who may, uh, developed the um, triune brain, three-parted brain, the, the reptilian medulla, the uh, uh, mammalian limbic or emotional system, and the human cortex or cognitive thinking system. Well, we we glory with the cortex. It's what makes us creative and, and able to do these amazing things that human beings can do because uh, no other creature has a cortex like ours. But the brain, the, the limbic brain, is still the ruler because it's the survival brain. And even though... Uh, we don't need it a lot of the time. When we have conflict or when there's a danger, it, it protects us. And if it's uh, if it's on too much, we we are not in our conscious brain then. And that's a lot. And that that re- replicates a lot of uh, what's going on in our country at this point. Uh, people are uh, how, how, not in their conscious we, brains very much. So how do we on a Let's use it preventatively for a moment. Okay, so we have this knowledge. We have this understanding about how we get traumatized, how it remains in our brain, how it replicates and creates ways and perhaps experiences to heal that that perhaps we do or don't do. How, let's, let's step back for a second saying, okay, now we're adults. We've already been through the childhood adverse experiences and perhaps we've processed some and not others. What would be a way that we start from here? Is it, is it possible as an adult? to clear the slate. What, and what does that mean, and how do we move forward? Well, I, I, I write about that in, in all three books, especially the, the new one, um, that the brain is very, very, very focused on surviving, more so than on thinking. And when we learn something that's dangerous, we tend never to forget it. And when we are conditioned to something, we tend never to be totally deconditioned. Pavlov's dog, you know, when they, they presented the the bell and didn't feed the dog anymore, took about four or five trials, the dog stopped salivating at the bell because they, they're used to being fed, but, and once they weren't fed for a while, they forgot the association of food with the bell. However, ten years later, one trial, and they were back conditioned because that's a survival response, and you never quite lose all of it. So you don't, you can't really clear the entire deck of events in your life that traumatize you, but you can continue. Can, you can extinguish most of them, and that also you can get a cognitive awareness of why things are happening. Uh, meaning f- for events that's conscious will will inhibit the amygdala, the, the alarm clock, the alarm center of the brain. And if you, for instance, have this terrible stiff neck and pain from a whiplash years ago, which has gone away with somatic experiencing, uh, and it comes back a little bit, you can say, oh, that's my tension muscle. I must be under stress. I know what that is. I'm, it's, I'm not dying. I don't have a ruptured disc. I don't have a pinched nerve. It's just a little bit of stress. And that knowledge is a healing knowledge that you can carry with you. Well, John Sarno certainly spoke to that decades, yes, exactly. decades ago and found that just the understanding and the peace that they can find uh, and not going to the anxiety and worry um, that it's so much more than it is provided some amazing relief. Yeah, he was an absolute pioneer in in the concept of causes for low back pain and neck pain. Uh, He said if you can convince yourself it's psychological, that's a weapon for you to dispense the, the pain. And if you really believe that, uh, the pain is no longer a threat. Uh, and so I, education and consciousness and awareness of, of the body and awareness of, of, of the feelings that that interrupt you all the time. You know, we have constant feelings within our body that tell us how we're doing. Uh, and if, and if, if it's a false feeling related to the fact it's traumatic, if you know it's false, that diminishes its importance and therefore its intensity dramatically. Right. If we know this now and we move forward and something still traumatic happens and we still go into a fight, flight, or freeze response, yes. right? Things do happen. Yes. So how um, 
how would you say we negotiate that experience in such a way that might alter it or diminish its ongoing effects? Well, awareness Just use of techniques we spoke or anything additionally well, like I think all of the somatic techniques are are unique for this. Uh, and I think what what you want to do is you want to take what happened in that experience, understand what it meant and why it occurred because of your past and because of that you are much more conscious now having been healed from a whole lot of other trauma. And and probably then do a little bit of work with any of the techniques, EMDR, somatic experiencing, brain spotting, uh, tapping. They're, they all have a physiologic basis. And a few, a few sessions of that will often clear the deck with that, that episode. So, But it's, a, you know, you have to recognize this still is a lifelong process. And it, it's, you're going to experience more traumas, and you know you're vulnerable. Uh, so be open to seeking help and also... Be kind to yourself. Important. The one thing I did want to ask you about on finally is the way that people recreate scenarios. So in other words, if they've been through certain traumas yeah. that they never got to discharge. And I know it gets a little metaphysical, a little quantum, it goes out of the way. But, but on the other hand, I believe that there is neurological foundation for almost seeking experiences to find an experience to complete a past trauma. Oh, that's well known. Yeah, I I have a chapter in both books on that, and Bessel van der Kolk has a, a great article, The Compulsion to Repeat the Trauma. There is a, it's like the um, Iraq and Afghanistan vets that come back, and they, they yearn to be back in combat, even though they were terrified and, and it was a terrible experience. Um, I think the brain... Uh, is probably trying to complete the the act, the act of self defense and safety uh, when the, when you want to repeat want to repeat it. People who cut themselves do it because of that. There are many examples of repeating the trauma, including uh, extreme athletics or extreme, extreme risk taking, just to get some endorphins released, which numb the the, uh, uh, the pain. So. Um, there are a lot of ways that people try to do this. Some are very healthy. Some are, are, are counterproductive. Uh, right. but, the, 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 but the message is, of course, if you experience these things, you should have the cognitive awareness that, ah, I must be under stress because my gut is starting to grind and growl and I'm having cramps. I must be under stress. And what's, what's going on in my life? Got it. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Scare, so much. Um, people that are interested in finding out more about your work, newest book, Eight Keys to Brain, brain, blah, blah, brain Body Balance, best way to be able to find out more information, your website, best way to order books, how would you like people to be directed? Well, I think my website, uh, I don't have a new book up there yet. Um, I've been working on it, but um, my other books are there. It'll take you to, to the Amazon uh, key, most people buy on Amazon now with Kindle and the like. And my, the new book is also available, available on Kindle. Um, so my website has the uh, ways to go. I have articles on the website that are uh, people can read and actually print off. Um, and I have a, a calendar of my of what I where I'm lecturing uh, so people can see where I am and if it's anywhere near them, they could go. And that website is www.trauma.com. Soma.com, T-R-A-U-M-A-S-O-M-A.com. And, yes, I was looking at the calendar this morning. Unfortunately, none in the Northwest, but some definitely. No, I, I do a fair amount in the Northwest. Uh, well, I look forward to in that. In California, but uh, not, not the rest of this year. Okay. Well, Dr. Scarry, I just want to thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you here. I hope that... Um, the little snip that we had at the beginning, there's been no, nothing traumatic and that everything is fine at home. And no, I really no, it's your time. But I, I got, I got uh, hung up in it for a little bit and it took me a while to get off the phone. So I appreciate your patience with it. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. I look forward to future interactions. And Well, thank you so much for coming to Change Your Mind Transformational Dialogue Radio, and I look forward to our next interaction. Thank, thank you so you, much Craig. for coming. I appreciate it. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye.